Lord Jesus, I pray for your grace and humility. Lord, please give me your grace and help me to wrap this up with power and with much grace. Oh Lord, help me, I pray. Help me in the name of Jesus. Okay, with that, we've come to the end of this series, and I would just want to give a brief summary. I first of all spoke about the reasons why I gave this video, and uh, it was in response to a video that was given on abiogenesis, where I felt that everything that was, was given in that video was incorrect, scientifically incorrect. And uh, so I wanted to, to clear things up on this. Then we also talked about the thermodynamics, how difficult it is to think of having a cell that has very low entropy, it is highly ordered, yet also a very high energy. And to think about how this could come, it's very difficult to think about even the thermodynamics of this system. And uh, we talked about what is abiogenesis. Abiogenesis is the study of, of how life came about. It differs, abiogenesis differs from evolution in that before you can ever discuss evolution, you have to get the first life. So this is the prerequisite to evolution, is to be able to deal with abiogenesis. Where does life first come from? This is before biology. If we're going to talk about life, if something is truly being made, remember for life we need to have responsiveness to the environment, we have to have growth and change, we have to have the ability to reproduce, it has to have a metabolism and breathe, it has to be able to have homeostasis, which is this steady internal state of physical, uh, of, of physical and a chemical conditions occurring, and it has to be made up of cells and have traits being able to pass on to the offspring. If you want to have a, a definition of life, it has to be made up of cells. Now, if somebody wants to redefine life, that's fine. But life as we know it, life as we know it here on Earth, every sort of life as we know it, not just some life, not just human life, but every sort of life as we know it consists of cells. And we have to be able to deal with the cellular construction one has to be able to make a cell. If you want to just, just call a chemical reaction life, well, then you're redefining things. But life as we know it needs cellular structure. We talked about the primordial soup, how many people are taught that there are chemicals in a, in a pond, for example, and there were lightning strikes, and that formed small molecules that came together and formed cells. Nothing, nothing like that has ever happened. That is a fallacy. And uh, people learn that beyond the sixth grade. They learn that certainly into high school that's learned. And that is where much of the general public believes life came from. Scientists don't know where life came from. They've never created it in a laboratory, even with all their skills. They've never come close. We showed how confused the general public is on this. Many people think that Scientists have created life in a laboratory. Far, far from it. Scientists have never created life in a laboratory. Uh, we talked about hype that comes from origin of life researchers themselves. There's a lot of hype from researchers in the field of, of uh, abiogenesis. It goes beyond just the hype that the press, press does. The, the, the researchers themselves turn it up, and then the press turns it up even more than that. That's a real problem because that causes the layperson to really think we're closer to making life or that we've even made life when we're not even close. We talked about homochirality, this fundamental quality of the vast majority of biological molecules where they have this handedness, where it's like the left hand and the right hand, non-superimposable mirror images. That's hard to do in a laboratory. We have never figured out how that could have been done in an abiological environment. Never figured out. When people say, oh, well, it came from space, generally only traces of material have been found from space, and those are generally totally racemic. They have both handedness there, so they're not of any biological origin that we know it. Once in a while, there have been claims of seeing some, some chirality, some, some, some 
uh, enantiomeric excess, but those numbers are usually generally very small. The highest one we cited was 60%, and that's in real contest, and that wasn't even for anything that's of biological origin. That was for a diastereomer of, of an amino acid that's found here on Earth. We discussed carbohydrates. That is the hardest class of compounds to figure out how they could have been made in an abiological environment. And that's why many people, when they make their videos, they try to avoid discussing carbohydrates, how those were made, because they have absolutely no idea, absolutely no idea how you can control the stereochemistry on that. We talked about Eschenmoser's work <clears throat> trying to control the stereochemistry on, on uh, uh, the, these... Uh, just the ribose, this, this sugar that you're going to need ultimately for the nucleotides. Just trying to make the ribose, he ended up, of course, he didn't have any homochirality there. He had the enantiomeric mixture, but he had 30 compounds that he could identify in 40 to 50 percent of the mixture and the other 50 to 60 percent of the mixture, a bunch of other compounds which he couldn't even identify, every one of them racemic. So this is far from being solved. And even if you could make the, the sugar, which is the building block of the building blocks, even if you could make the monomeric sugar, we have no idea how those could have hooked together. The problem is you have so many different places where you could hook this thing together and trying to control one other than the other. It's impossible without blocking chemistry, without blocking. Enzymes can do it, but it is impossible to think about how that was done in an abiological sense. Maybe one day we'll, we'll know it, but right now we have no understanding of how that was done on an early Earth without enzymes being around to do that. And, and uh, uh, remember, to get enzymes, you have to have nucleotides. To get nucleotides, you have to have the carbohydrates. And so, so we've got this ultimate chicken and egg problem. And so how do you get the carbohydrates? Because there's so many different ways you can link these things together. And then the other thing is the stereochemistry. There's an anomeric center where the hydroxyl group could be, be uh, alpha below or beta above the ring. So that, that can vary back and forth. All of that has to be set to be able to make these systems. You have to have these things in homochiral form. We talked about how these are just the building blocks of the building blocks. The polymerizations are really difficult. Then we talked about peptides and the problems with making peptides, how hard it is to do that. Many people have said, okay, well, you can use the, the, the Miller-Urey reaction and you can get many of the, the basic amino acids. But all of those amino acids were racemic. They weren't homochiral. And if you try to polymerize the, the amino acids, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You get just very small things and none of the ones with active side chains. If you have an active side chain where you have a functional group on a side chain, like a thiol, an SH moiety, or an OH moiety, or carboxylic acid moiety. Those are often more reactive in the polymerizations than are the amine and the acid of the amino acid. And so when we do a synthesis in a laboratory, we block those. We have blocking chemistry to do that. Nature is just fine, has enzymes that can selectively do this. We have no idea how that was done pre-biology in a, uh, uh, a biogenesis type scenario before you had enzymes around to do this because from enzymes to have an enzyme you have to link together the amino acids we have no idea how that was done there's been proposals that they didn't even come from the amino acids because amino acids don't polymerize in water because there's vitrionic so that's a real problem so so it's very difficult to get those to polymerize so there's other ideas out there but again that is for purely material that is racemic and no great understanding on how that was ever done. Then we talked about the nucleotides. A nucleotide is the, the uh, ribose sugar or the deoxyribose sugar, whether you're dealing with RNA or DNA respectively. And then you have a nucleobase on there and you, you have to have a phosphate on there. Nucleobases, we didn't cover much. There are ways to get at nucleobases, but again, that's using chemistry where they're using relay syntheses, where they're, they're, they're uh, uh, purifying in other methods. It's still not easy to get those, but it is possible. But now you have to get those on a ribose sugar. Moiety. If you can't make the sugars, you can't make the nucleotides. There have been proposals and methods that we showed, for example, those of John Sutherland, that would hook those up 
in a circuitous route that would build the sugar around while it was already before the sugar had formed, while it was hooked up to the to the uh, uh, nucleo base. But again, that was a diastereomeric mixture, and it, it was not homochiral. So again, and that was just one example, many, many steps to do that. And again, using this relay synthesis, which is cheating, because you can't carry it through. So, so the origin of life researchers continue to put things on an early Earth that they themselves will not bear. But somehow, under a rock, someplace, this happened, and we're supposed to believe that. Very hard to fathom. And then what we did is we talked about the lipids. Lipids, everybody thought that was easy. And people say, oh, well, the fatty acids form spontaneously. Remember what I told you. That's a code word. When people say form spontaneously, that's the origin of life researcher's code word for I have no idea how it happened. Regardless of the rate in which something forms, there is a mechanism for its forming. How does a fatty acid form from methane? How does that happen? The Fischer-Tropsch reaction has never been shown to work in a, an environment that would be, that would be uh, uh, prebiotic. Neither has the glycoaldehyde route to make a fatty acid. How do we make these? We don't even know how to make the fatty acids, let alone combine those with, with a glycerol moiety such that we pick out selectively one of the two enantiotopic hydroxymethyl groups on glycerol to hook that, that lipid, to, to hook the, the fatty acid onto. Nobody knows how that was done in a homochiral sense. And then also, how then it was done to get a second one on there and then to also get the, 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 um, the ethanol amine on there. Again, this chemistry is hard to work out. Hard to know. We looked at the Devaraj synthesis of these. But again, he started with the fatty acid already in hand, which he took from nature. And he used reagents that are not available on a prebiotic earth. We showed that, even though it was said to be a prebiotic-like route. We showed that. So again, there's so many problems, even just getting the lipids. You can't make a lipid bilayer just out of fatty acids that's going to respond in a cell. As we learned in the literature, you don't get the proton gradients that you're going to be able to get. So just saying they could have just formed with fatty acid lipid bilayers is wrong. We don't know how to make the lipid bilayers such that the outside and the inside are different. We only know how to do that when we have enzymes to do that. Nobody knows how to do that in a prebiotic route. Every protocell that has ever been made, the quote-unquote protocells, which are supposed to be the early forms of what might have happened in life, all of those are homogeneous inside and outside. And you would not get the proton gradient that you would need, and you can't just do that off of fatty acid. So they're buying those lipids, they buy them, and still they can't get the inside and the outside to be different. Then we talked about chiral-induced spin selectivity, which shows us that chirality, homochirality, is not an afterthought for nature. It's not something that came later. You can't get the alignments that you need in just RNA and DNA and protein alignments if you don't have chirality, number one. Number two, chiral-induced select spin selectivity tells us how biological reactions can be so clean because they're working on polarized electrons. They're working on, on electrons that are going in one direction and not the other because they go down these chiral manifolds, and that's what gives them the high yields. Before that, you would never get the high yields. You say, well, maybe early life dealt with more impurities. No, it can't be. It, that can't happen because the impurities would gum up the works. They, they, they start taking up the reagents that you're going to need. If you don't have high fidelity turnover, you can't do this. And nature does this using chiral-induced spin selectivity. And then we talked about, all right, let's pull everything together. You couldn't make the building blocks of the building blocks, the homochiral compounds that you need. You couldn't polymerize them. The origin of life researchers could not polymerize them as they needed to do. So they couldn't do that either. But we'll give them that. We'll give them the, the building blocks of the building blocks in homochiral form. They can't polymerize them. Okay, we'll give them the polymerized structure. We'll give them the enzymes. 
We'll give them the DNA. We'll give them the RNA. Because remember, every time you try to make RNA, they say RNA can, can uh, uh, replicate itself. RNA does not replicate itself. Only examples, the biggest example is known is that only 7% of an RNA that was primed and designed to replicate itself was able to replicate only 7% of itself. And that 7% was too short to be a template for another replication. So that's something that's totally overblown. The whole RNA hypothesis that you would, you, all you need is a piece of RNA and it goes from there. That's a bunch of nonsense. That's a bunch of nonsense. And we showed that. The whole RNA hypothesis, world hypothesis, is nonsense because you can't just have RNA. Why? Because RNA is unstable. RNA decomposes at minus 80 degrees. Its half-life is even very short. Certainly at room temperature, the thing is going to be short. And remember, they like to have some reactions going at 100 degrees, some reactions going at low temperature. How these things move to different parts of the Earth, we discuss that. That's a real problem. But RNA, if you just try to get, get the nucleotide to polymerize, you get the, the uh, uh, three five linkage with you which you want along with the two five linkage and the two five linkage shuts the whole thing down in fact when you have two five linked systems that's been shown to act as small interfering rna siRNA, which stops the whole process and every time you try to just do a random polymerization or on clay on clay we showed examples where you get sometimes 30 percent 2-5 linkage, 30% of the wrong linkage that you want. Sometimes you get 60% of the long, wrong linkage that you want. If you have any of the wrong linkage, the thing shuts down. It's a problem, polymerizing it. You want to polymerize DNA? Okay, how are you going to do that? How are you going to get this thing to polymerize? And remember, you like to have amino acids around, you like to have thiols around, you like to have, have these other systems around. How come those don't interrupt the polymerizations? So they couldn't do the polymerizations either. So we just give them that. We'll give you the polymerized form. So we'll give you DNA. We'll give you RNA. We'll give you the, 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 the polysaccharides in whatever order you want. You name it, we'll give it to you. There Inherent in that is the information. When you start polymerizing these, putting these together, that is the code for life. How that code originally came about, we have no idea. But we'll give that to you. You tell us the code you want, you tell us the order that you want, so, so the DNA will prescribe to the RNA, and the RNA will go and go ahead and build the proteins that you need to build life. Okay, we'll give you all of that. We'll give you all the DNA you want, all the RNA you want, all the proteins that you want. Because a Nobel Prize would be given if you could take DNA, RNA, and the proteins, and you could go ahead and assemble life. But remember what you have to have to, for life. RNA alone can't do this. Remember, biophysicists, not me, biophysicists figured out that you needed over 200 protein-coding genes you needed over 200 protein coding genes. That means you needed whole segments of DNA, over 200 of them, just to make the very basic components that can operate a cell. So just having RNA doesn't give it to you. It won't do it. The RNA world hypothesis is a bunch of nonsense. And that's why the world now is just coming out, just recently publications are coming out showing that it could not have been RNA alone. So another one bites the dust. Another theory bites the dust. You go from this being at a world of amino acids and proteins to a DNA world to the RNA world hypothesis. That one bites the dust now. So all of these theories keep evolving and they keep dying because they're really a bunch of nonsense. They don't work. There are fundamental problems that we have to address before we even get to that. So what happens is you have all of these components, we'll give it to you. Go ahead, assemble the dream team you want and build a cell. Go ahead, build a cell. Try it. Go ahead, do it. See if you can build a cell. Nobody can do this. Nobody in their right mind, no scientists in their right mind. You, you assemble the teams of biologists, chemists, origin of life researchers, YouTubers, however many people you want on that team, and you give them all the RNA, DNA, and proteins that they want enzymes that they want and and you give them you give them the uh, uh, um, the lipids that they want and say go ahead make a cell because somehow on an early earth this happened under a rock in a little pool somewhere 
Why can't you do it in your laboratory? They can't. They can't. Remember, a Nobel Prize would be given if for anyone that would make cellular life. Anyone. Even taking the components from nature and putting it back together and bringing life to that thing. A Nobel Prize would be given. Why don't they do it? Because they can't. But we're supposed to believe that somewhere in some hydrothermal vent or under a pool, all of this came together? Come on. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Now, if you can't put this together, then there's a real problem. How did life originate? We just don't know. It originated somehow, but we just don't know. We're clueless on the origin of life, and that's why I keep saying it. That's the problem here. We're clueless on this. So here's my appeal to the graduate students that are thinking about going in and joining a laboratory that studies origin of life. I urge you to think twice or three times before you accept that position. And here's why. Because your professor will die of old age before you ever get close to figuring out how to make life. You will die of old age before you ever get close. And your students will die of old age before they ever get close. Because we're not addressing this, the fundamental problems. You want to address a fundamental problem? How do you get homochirality? How does that form? How did homochirality form? What was the basis for this? And show some examples that are prebiotically relevant for that being able to happen. Because remember, a mindless earth under a rock somewhere got this thing figured out. Why don't you try showing uh, how there could be reactions that can form, that can happen when you have diverse mixtures. So you have lots of different enantiomers, lots of different diastereomers, all in the same mixture, very similar compounds. How do you get that one that you want to react without those other ones competing? That's the key. How do you get those th that to react? That's a hard thing to solve. That'd be a good problem to solve. That's a fundamental problem that needs to be solved. What about the mass transfer problem? You want to start with a kilo of each of the 20 amino acids? Okay, we'll give you a kilo of that. Somehow, each of them, you got a kilo of, kilo of them. They're not mixed together. They're an individual bottle. How do you get those to make anything in any reliable yield such that that kilo is going to go all the steps that you need? Because as you know, you start with a kilo, kilo of something, and then after about 10 steps, you're left with about one gram of material. And 10 more steps, you're left with a milligram of material. Why does that happen? Because your yields aren't that high. That happens even in purely synthetic chemistry. And so you're always doing what's called bringing up material from the rear, bringing up material from the beginning. And so a lot of time is spent bringing in more material. How do you do that on an early earth? When it runs out of material, how does it go back and make more? It never kept a laboratory notebook. And some people on videos claim, well, it's constantly making more. It's constantly making more. Then how come we don't see that on this earth where it's constantly making all of these wonderful lots of compounds? That doesn't happen. And what about if you did have a certain arrangement in a, in a DNA. Somehow the, the ribose formed. Somehow the nucleobases, the four nucleobases got on there. Somehow they polymerized cleanly so that you had DNA and that DNA had the right form to prescribe the synthesis. How do you make more of that with that same arrangement? We're clueless. Remember, when you want to make your cell, you got to deal with all the substructure, the interactomes. Remember the interactomes that you had 10 to the 79 billion, 10 to the 79 billion power of combinations of just protein-protein interactions in a simple yeast cell. You want to say that earlier cells were simpler? Okay, fine. But they still had to have 200 protein-coding genes. So you still had to have a huge number, instead of having three, say, say instead of having 3,000 proteins. Say so you had 200 proteins. How are you going to get these to order? How are you going to get order in that cell? Because remember, a lot of the communication that happens in a cell is through non-covalent interactions, where you get electrostatic potentials that are traveling from one molecule to another. 
A lot of this is happening through non-covalent interactions. So the alignment, the arrangement of them is very important. And that's why when a cell divides, it takes that information on both, splits it to both sides, and then gives that information and passes it along. How did that happen? How did that happen for the original cell? We have no idea. There are fundamental things you want to address. I cannot, as a scientist, say that we will never solve this problem by naturalistic terms. I cannot. As a scientist, I can't say that. I cannot say what could never be done. Maybe in a few hundred years or in a thousand years, people will have figured this out. But what I can say is that we're nowhere close to figuring it out. And you might say, how do you know we're nowhere close? Because the more we learn about a cell, the more complex it becomes, like this interactome thing. I mean, people didn't think about that a few years ago. And then you go, uh-oh, that adds a le level of complexity I never even considered. So the goalposts keep moving. We are here. We're trying to figure out how life came. We thought that this was going to be easy when we thought all a cell was was a bunch of protoplasm. But now as we learn more about the complexity of the cell, the goalposts keep moving further and further away from us. That's what tells us that we're not close to solving a problem. Because the goalposts move further away, we're getting further away from the solution. That's how I can tell you we are nowhere close. There's going to have to be a lot of thinking. I'll also appeal to the funding agencies. You keep funding more of the same thing to take a bunch of chemicals that people buy and they make a bunch of stereo scrambled compounds that could never go by that route had it been a prebiotic earth. And you keep funding it. I don't know why you do that. Why don't you address some of the more fundamental issues here? There's problems with this sort of science. And so uh, I didn't even address the, the origin of life researchers themselves. I mean, these are good scientists. They're good scientists. I don't mean to come against them in any way, but I think that you have to come clean and talk about the state of the field where it really is because this, you, you ramp things up a little bit and the, cre the press ramps it up in order of magnitude. You've got to ask them, let me see the article before you publish it and many of them would let you do this because this thing gets ramped up like crazy. What I want you to notice is I didn't mention God in any of this. I don't need to. Science itself tells us that abiogenesis, as it's proposed by naturalistic terms today, is unacceptable because it just doesn't work. You don't need to invoke God. You don't need to invoke intelligent designers. Just the naturalistic means, science itself screams that abiogenesis, as it is proposed, is not the route to how life came about. Some may argue, well, Tour, why don't you come up with a route? No, we do this all the time in science. If we see, a, if there's a hypothesis, we can shoot down a hypothesis if it does not match up with the facts that are needed on the ground. You don't have to have a contrary or a, a hypothesis in order to shoot down an existing hypothesis. The way you do science is if there is a hypothesis, but it doesn't measure up to the facts that are needed on the ground, that hypothesis does not measure up. We don't need to discover religion to, to understand the facts of science. Abiogenesis is, is, and science in itself tells us. And now I want to thank everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this series. Uh, I know it got fairly involved, but there was no other way to do this. I had to teach you the problems with this and so that you could understand my pain when people say we've got this thing figured out and I'm, I'm just reeling because we don't have it figured out at all. And scientists are even sitting there saying, yeah, that kind of makes sense. It doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't make sense at all, at all. What are you thinking about? Where is your mind when you think that this makes sense? When you think the foremost reaction makes for you the, the, uh, uh, the carbohydrates, what are you thinking? Most of the time, people have never read the scientific literature. Most scientists never read the scientific literature on origin of life to see how crazy it is in the proposals of what they put forward, that these things could never happen outside of, of, of a laboratory and working with, with all of this insight from people. And even with that, they can't get very much to happen. So we had to dig into some of the details. 
Uh, you can check out some of our other videos on, on my channel, DR James Tour, on YouTube, uh, uh, DR James Tour. You can check out some of the other videos, and there will be more videos coming. So, anyway, with that, I'll end. And uh, uh, please subscribe if you, if you like these videos. In every one of the videos, push the like button, because what that does is it tells the, the, the algorithms, the YouTube al algorithms, to, to funnel more people there so this word can get out. So it's important for you to push the thumbs up and uh, it's important for you to subscribe and that will drive more traffic for the algorithms. And then uh, thank you for joining us and uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks for joining us. If you want to subscribe, just click right here, subscribe, and we'll give you a shout out when the next video comes out. Thank you.